Anonymous question. Um, why do people say there's no biblical basis against contraception when God kills Onan for it? Oh, this, I'm really glad this question came up. I don't think I've ever received this question. All right. We're going to, we're going to look at this passage and then I'll read the question again because we're going to need that context. So there's a woman who is, um, <clears throat> uh, she gets married to a brother and then that brother dies and she has no kids yet. Now there was something called levy rate marriage in the old Testament, not Levite. It's not about Levites or priests or anything. Levy rate, meaning like that it's, it's, you keep it within the brothers, within the family. So if a woman gets married, um, in, in Israel under the law, and this is not something that currently has to happen, but it's under the law of the old Testament and the man dies. Here's a problem. This son, he has an allotted land an inheritance in the land of Israel that now will be someone else is going to take. It will not go with their family name. And so his wife would marry because the promised land is pretty important for Israel would marry the, the, one of his brothers, not necessarily if he was already married, he could pass on this. And we see this happen like in the book of Ruth, one of the people passes on, on marrying, uh, Ruth and, um, that's a whole other thing in the shoe situation, whole interesting story. But <clears throat> then she would marry the brother and the firstborn child would be raised in the name of the original father, which is a way of honoring him and carrying on that family name. Then that land would go to that child in the name of that man. And so that the family name could be carried on. Okay. And here's a story where this happens with, with Tamar, I believe it is. And she gets married and the brother doesn't want her to have a kid because he, he wants Maybe he wants the land for himself. He does not want to raise up a kid to the name of his brother. He's dishonoring his brother. So in verse eight of Genesis 38, then Judah said to Onan, go in to perform your, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. That's that levy rate marriage thing. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went in, this is, this is a euphemism for being intimate together, right? Whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would you know, parent alert, you can see on the screen, you, you might want to mute the video, pause it for a second. Um, the Bible is not written for children <laughs> in most places, but Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. So Onan's doing this. He's, this is, you could call this birth control, right? I mean, he is controlling pregnancy. Ultimately, he's interesting that if you're, if you're controlling birth, that's actually technically immoral, but he's trying to avoid pregnancy. And verse 10 says, and what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And he put him to death. And so lots of sons are dying here because of their wickedness. Um, God really cares about preserving the names and the land and all this sort of thing. It's connected to Jesus ultimately. So here's the question. Why do people say there's no biblical basis against contraception when God kills Onan for it? And the punishment for that is not death according to Deuteronomy 25 verses seven through 10. Okay. So let's now add another verse. Deuteronomy 25 or seven through 10. Is this saying that birth control in the sense of contraception, okay, not, not, uh, preventing a, a new, a living human being, an embryo from say, um, attaching to the, the mother or something like that, but rather just preventing the conception itself. Is that bad? Um, an immoral. And if the man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband refu husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of the, his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull off his sandal, pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And so she takes his sandal and spits in his face. This is a public shaming thing. It's shameful that he's not doing this. And she shall answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. And the name of his house shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. <laughs> Maybe that flowed better in Hebrew. <laughs> you are the house of him who had his sandal pulled off. But, um, but yeah, so let me just say this, uh, to my anonymous questioner number seven. So the punishment is actually not death penalty in Deuteronomy 20, uh, 25 verses seven through 10. So the punishment here was just shaming. It was a, a sense of shaming. And it's interesting how this plays out in Ruth. In Ruth, the man already has, a, he's already married. And so they don't do this spitting in the face thing. They pull the sandal off like ceremonially, but there's no shame associated with it because it's considered, oh, this is a different situation. This isn't like say Onan. Finally, we get to the question. Onan 
spilling his seed on the ground to avoid her getting pregnant, is that a biblical commentary on all forms of birth control or all forms of, excuse me, contraception, you know, control? And I, I think the answer is no, because once you see the full context, you realize there's so much more going on here, right? He doesn't want to raise up a child to his brother's name. It's not just not wanting to have a child, period, for some reason. And so it, it seems there's too much going on here to just translate this broadly into all sort of contraception discussions. It just seems like there's too much going on there. So I I would say no, uh, that there's no biblical basis in that sense. There's none against it. I think the best we can do on arguing this is we can point out the positivity of having children, that children are a blessing and a good thing and they're valuable and wonderful. We can point to commands to be fruitful and multiply, but then we can... People can counter this. I'm going to have a, a long debate with you in like 30 seconds here. <laughs> I just crammed it. People can counter this with, well, Jesus lauded singleness and so did Paul. So they obviously didn't think the obligation to have children was something that fell on each person as a personal obligation, even though it's a generally good thing and something that humanity is supposed to do as a whole. Okay. So what about families who say they've, they've had three kids and they're, they're thinking for whatever reason, they're going to stop having kids. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to make a judgment call on them. I'm going to leave that between them and the Lord.